This man says he can tell us who the next president of the United States will be. <laughs> He's only guessed correctly for the last 40 years. <laughs> He's only guessed correctly for the last 40 years. But he doesn't use polling, he doesn't use focus groups or some sophisticated analysis. He's a professor at American University in Washington, D.C. His name is Alan Lickman. Some have called him the prediction professor. He's developed a system for predicting winners of presidential elections. These 13 factors, he calls the 13 keys, seem to be predictive of election outcomes. And he came up with these from going back and studying the presidential elections from 1860 up until 1980. That's about 120 years worth, right around 31 elections. He says it's not about campaign tactics, it's not about marketing or events, it's not about presidential debates, or even the candidates themselves per se. It's about performance. It's about governance of the party that's holding the White House. And if the party holding the White House is doing a good job, typically voters give them four more years. Lickman said, one key can't stand alone in predicting. And obviously, if you stop and think about, voters don't simply vote on just one issue. It's usually a totality of issues. He says that all of the keys must be taken into consideration in their totality. These 13 keys really are 13 statements that we'll go over. They're either true or they're false. And if six or more of the keys go against the incumbent, then they lose. Let me briefly run through each of these keys. I'll give you a definition, can I give you some historical context and let you see what Lickman is thinking here of these patterns that seem to be very evident throughout United States history in regards to presidential elections. Are you ready? Here's the first one. The first one is party mandate. Key number one is party mandate. After midterms elections, the incumbent party holds more seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. Is that true or false? Key number two, contest. There is no serious contest for the incumbent party. Is that true or false? Now, we've had previous incumbents face challenges in their own party, which typically divides the party and normally leads to the challenger being victorious. Key number three, incumbency. The incumbent party is the sitting president. Is that true or false? And you stop and think about that. The presidency itself as the incumbent has some inherent advantages. They have name recognition. They have media attention. They have what we call the bully pulpit where the president can set the national agenda. They can write executive orders. Incumbency has a lot of weight to it. Key number four, third party. There is no significant third party or independent campaign. Now, Lickman says this is really indicative of someone that would be able to carry 5% or more of the popular vote. Is this true or false? And we've had, you stop and think about many third party campaigns that have come around in US history. And they're usually directing fire at the incumbent party. There's discontent. Uh, Lickman says it's a barometer of discontent to have a third party candidate jump in a race. And they're usually aiming their fire at the incumbent. Key number five, short term economy. The economy is not in recession during the election. Is that true or false? It doesn't have to necessarily meet the narrow definition of recession. It, there just simply needs to be a widespread perception of the economy being in recession. One perfect example of that would be 1992 when Bill Clinton was running for president. His campaign said, it's the economy stupid and tried convincing Americans that we were in a deep recession. And we come to find out later that in 1991, we were coming out of the recession, but still in 1992, voters had the perception that the economy was in recession and was not any better, and they wanted to change parties. Key number six, long-term economy. 
Now for this one, this one relies strictly on economic growth measure. This long-term economy key uh, is, is one of these keys where we have what Lichtman describes as having a triggering effect. That is, as it's one key is turned, it can trigger uh, the turn of other keys. And one perfect example is this long-term economy. Uh, Herbert Hoover in 1932 running for uh, re-election here. Uh, it, the economy is not great at all. We're in the Great Depression and Hoover lost the midterm elections in 1930. Uh, the short-term economy didn't look good. The long-term economy didn't look good. There, there was some social unrest. All of a sudden the cha challenger comes along and Franklin Roosevelt with charisma there and promising to bring a new deal. And Hoover ended up losing that election of 1932. Key number seven, policy change. The incumbent administration affects major changes in national policy. And this is with the whole idea that broad changes give the president the image of accomplishment or of having some success. And stop and think about some of the ones we've had in the past. Lincoln had the impression and the image that he helped bring an end to the Civil War and which brought about the end of slavery there. Hayes is the president who is associated with ending Reconstruction. McKinley ushers in this a new foreign policy focus of, of American expansionism after the Spanish-American War. And then you had Franklin Roosevelt coming along and bringing in bigger government and his New Deal programs and the appearance that uh, these programs would help change and, and end the Depression. Key number eight, social unrest. There is no sustained social unrest during the term. Is that true or false? Now, you can have some unrest in a presidential term, but this key is really dependent on whether or not it's sustained. Uh, the key is then turned to the challenger. Stop about some of these events that we've had in the past. In 1932, with the, once again, the effects of the Great Depression, you had the March on Washington, what we call the Bonus March on Washington. In 1932, that key was turned against Herbert Hoover. Then in 1968, you have the Vietnam War protesters, and you have the Civil Rights uh, Marches, and then you have the Democratic Convention itself and division there. That key was turned against Humphrey in that election. Key number nine, scandal. The incumbent administration is untainted by major scandal. Some examples we've had in the past. In 1976, uh, the key was turned against Gerald Ford because of Watergate and Nixon and all that Watergate had brought about. Then in 2000, with uh, cl the Clinton impeachment, that key was also turned against Gore. In 2020, the Peach, the two impeachments that President Trump faced turned that key against him in the election of 2020. These major scandals really discredit the president. They might question the president's integrity. They might question their ability of upholding the law. Key number 10, foreign or military failure. The incumbent administration suffers from no major failure. We've had some in, in United States history, 1952, Truman's inability to end the Korean War turned the key to Eisenhower, and Stevenson ended up losing that election in 1952 against Eisenhower. Then in 1968, you have LBJ being blamed for the, v the height of the Vietnam War there, and the war continuing there, and that key turned towards Nixon, and Humphrey lost that election uh, to Nixon. And then 1980, the, the continuing Iranian hostage crisis, Carter couldn't get out from underneath there, and it, and it was a, an apparent and certain failure on his part. And that ended up turning the key towards Ronald Reagan. Key number 11 is foreign or military success. The incumbent administration achieves major success in foreign or military affairs. And since 19, really since World War II here, a majority of the successes have been victories in war or they've been historic treaties that have been signed. And you can see from this graphic here, a little bit of both. Now, the last two we call the personality keys. And they really deal with this idea of charisma. Of course, the, the, the 
definition of charisma, a, a special magnetic charm or appeal. This is, this is a, an appeal that a candidate can have that actually brings in voters outside of their normal base. Key number 12, incumbent charisma. The incumbent candidate is charismatic or a national hero. Lickman says that we've only had about six candidates from 1860 up to about 1980 that have had charisma just from between this time period here. They've been persuasive, they've had oratory skills, and they've been great communicators. And you, you know, we've actually had two of them in spite of the fact that they had uh, they were charismatic and they had this charisma, they still lost their elections, James G. Blaine and William Jennings Bryan. And Lickman also points out, when it comes to this idea of being a national hero, he said we've really only had two in American history. Ulysses S. Grant, who is accredited with helping us end the Civil War, when he ran for president, they said he saved the Union. And then the other one was Dwight D. Eisenhower, a big hero following World War II. And then key number 13, challenger charisma. The challenging candidate is not charismatic or a national hero. Is that true or false? In most cases with uh, personality keys, they're pretty much split evenly between both candidates. I mean, they really sort of offset one another. Unless, however, you have a candidate that comes along that has real charisma, and in that case, it gives them an advantage. What do you think about Littman's 13 keys? Do you think any of them are too subjective? And do you think there's any factors or perhaps patterns of history that Littman should include in his keys that he left out? I'd be interested in what you think. Leave me your thoughts in the comments section below. Now, you want to know what Professor Lickman is currently predicting will win this year's upcoming election? Check out the link above and check out our companion video and see who Lickman is currently predicting six months out uh, who will win the presidential election of 2024. Did you learn something new today? Did you get some value from what you watched? Hit the like button for us. And if you haven't subscribed to our Press Politics family yet, do that now. Thanks so much for watching. Check out some of the other uploads we have on our channel.